Anna Stills, uh, to the Graduate Conference in Political Theory in 2017, obviously. Um, and she's currently a professor of politics at Princeton University, but she's also a graduate of this lovely department, um, which is very exciting. So we're happy to welcome her back. Uh, her talk today is Theorizing Collective Self-Determination, and I believe it's part of a book project that she's working on, on the sovereignty of states, political citizenship, and state authority. So welcome, Professor Stills. Great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me back uh, to this place. I have filled with lots of memories when I was walking over to, to uh, through the yard and over to Seagis, although Seagis wasn't really yet here when I was a student, but um, it's great to be back. Uh, and the second thing I should say to start off is that my, the title of my talk is Theorizing Collective Self-Determination. I didn't plan to be giving this talk on the day that Catalonia was going to declare independence from Spain and the central government was going to declare that it was taking over. Um, but it's certainly a topical um, theme. So uh, as that remark illustrates, claims to self-determination are quite right widespread in contemporary politics at the moment. Um, obviously, uh, the Catalan secession movement, but also the Scottish secession movement the recent Brexit campaign, various different movements for indigenous and local self-governance, and populist parties on both the left and the right all appeal to some version of this idea. So they argue that political groups have the right to control their own affairs and to decide matters for themselves. And in the eyes of many, that claim to self-determination is currently at risk of being usurped by trends towards kind of ever-increasing globalization, in which more and more important decisions seem to be made by technocratic elites and corporate special interests in ways that are insulated and seem quite distant from popular um, control and participation. And the principle of self-determination also seems to have some prima facie legitimacy. It plays a major role in, con in contemporary international law, for example, and it was the inspiration for the post-World War II decolonization movement. Article 1, the first article of both the 1966 Human Rights Covenants, for example, declares that, quote, all peoples have the right of self-determination, by virtue of which they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. And the principle also plays a key role in the UN Charter, in the 1966 General Assembly Resolution that granted independence to colonial peoples, and the 1970 Declaration on Friendly Relations Among States. But the whole idea of self-determination is also subject to uh, a raft of important criticisms. So many people argue that the whole notion is really nothing more than an illusion. As Mill famously put it in On Liberty, it is, quote, not the government of each by himself, but of each by all the rest. So in any modern mass society, citizens have and really can only have a tiny negligible influence over political decisions. And given that the members of any group will disagree and diverge in their political values, at best it seems that self-government could only mean being governed by a democratic majority, one that's often going to be at odds with any particular individual's views. Moreover, given the importance of expertise in mu much of our contemporary political decision-making and the global scope of many of our problems, surely it's mistaken to think that any feasible devolution of power or reconfiguration of our institutions or redrawing our boundaries could, get, could give ordinary citizens a kind of meaningful control over the conditions of their political life. And further, the principle of self-determination faces a whole host of well-known challenges around the issue of defining the self. So what groups exactly can claim this right to be self-governing? Is it the populations of existing states? Is it regional governments? Is it cultural or ethnic groups? Is it other kinds of internal minorities? So when we start to think seriously about those kinds of questions, it's hard not to agree with Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, who famously complained that this principle of self-determination was just a muddled idea that was simply loaded with dynamite. And those kinds of problems lead critics to contend that when thinking about the legitimacy of political rule, we should abandon any aspiration to self-governance and instead content ourselves with just or good governance. So introducing a little bit of terminology, and I hope some of you have a handout. I think there might have been an issue where we ran out, but if you don't have one, you might be able to share with your neighbor, and I think some more copies are coming soon. 
Uh, but introducing a little bit of terminology, I'm going to call this um, the functionalist account of legitimacy. So on a functionalist view, an institution has a right to rule if it governs in a reasonably just and efficient manner. So in theorizing uh, state legitimacy, functionalism focuses on the quality of state institutions, and it um, abandons any concern for self-determination. So why, why shouldn't we embrace functionalism? Abandoning a concern for who governs us for what seems to be a potentially more realistic and feasible concern with how well we're governed. Well, despite what I think is for many of us a kind of attractive hard-headedness and realism about this functionalist view, I want to argue against it. And I want instead to defend the contemporary political relevance of, of self-determination. So I'm going to draw in important ways on a Rousseauian and Kantian tradition to develop what I call a political autonomy theory of self-determination. And this theory holds that in addition to providing good governance, a legitimate state must also reflect the shared will of the people subject to it. And of course, much here is going to turn on what we count as being a shared will. And I'm going to interpret a shared will as an actual joint intention held by a particular domain of the state's ordinary citizens to cooperate together through particular political institutions. And I'm also going to offer an explanation of why, it's, why we should think it's especially important that the state reflect its citizens' shared will in addition to providing them with just governance. And I'm going to tie this to a weighty individual interest in autonomy, which I will argue is jeopardized whenever a person is subjected to what I'm going to call alien coercion. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to out, briefly outline my approach to defining the self in the self-determination and also to develop some of the implications of my view for issues around secession and internal autonomy for minorities of the kind that's raised by what happened today. OK, so let me start off with what I, I take to be an important objection to the functionalist account. And the objection is, is that it's unable to offer any determinate theory of the state's proper boundaries. So while the functionalist may show that that states are in general necessary to establish justice, the view cannot address which particular people or places should be included within any particular state's jurisdiction, or indeed why we should prefer having a plurality of states in the world to a single world state. Indeed, the functionalists may license colonialism or involuntary annexation, and by that I mean the unilateral imposition of political institutions onto unwilling groups. Now, of course, as it was historically practiced, colonialism was wrong for a whole host of different reasons, including human rights abuses, economic exploitation, racism, and so on. And the functionalist view, with its focus on just and efficient governance, is going to have the resources to criticize very many of those wrongs. But still, we might worry that, the, that functionalism could license a kind of benevolent colonialism, so long as the colonizer did a reasonable job at providing good governance. So particularly in the later colonial period, European colonizers often invoked arguments that were grounded in liberal principles to justify their practices. So colonial rule was defended on the basis that it would further the moral and material well-being of subject populations or it would advance their commerce and development. And we can think of modern analogs to this kind of civilizing colonialism. So for example, uh, a powerful state might an annex a foreign population against their will in the aftermath of a justified humanitarian intervention on grounds that it could do a better job ruling them than they could do at ruling themselves. And in a case like this, the state in power might actually be willing to govern quite decently. And it might even enfranchise its new constituents, granting them a democratic vote in the wider sort of post-merger merger polity. Still, I think many people have a strong intuition that a population that was unwillingly annexed in this kind of way would have a morally significant complaint. They might not be subject to gravely unjust rule uh, or governance, but they are denied a kind of self-rule or self-governance. And that violation of self-rule, I believe, is a wrong in itself, even where it's not accompanied by further abuses and rights violations. So reflecting on these kinds of cases of colonialism and involuntary annexation, it seems we, we should take seriously the idea that there may be an additional dimension to state legitimacy, one that goes beyond the provision of reasonably just and efficient governance. Um, and it's that additional dimension, I think, uh, 
that a self-determination theory tries to capture. On a self-determination theory, it's as important that, the politi that political institutions reflect the priorities and values of those who are governed by them as that those institutions score well on an objective, some kind of objective measure. So <clears throat> two fairly well-known accounts of self-determination that go beyond functionalism by adding kind of additional criteria for state legitimacy are the nationalist theory on the one hand and the voluntarist theory on the other. So a nationalist theory holds that culturally defined nations have rights to self-determination. So on this kind of a view, a state has a right to rule a particular territory and its population if, first of all, the majority of that population shares a national culture, they are a nation, and second, that state reflects and reproduces that nation's culture, granting it a kind of privileged status and state symbols and ceremonies and the school system and so on. A voluntarist theory derives collectives' rights of self-determination from the free choices of individuals, holding that individuals cannot be legitimately subjected to political rule without their actual individual consent. So what I'm going to do today is to propose a third alternative view, the political, what I call the political autonomy account of self-determination. And that theory draws in particular on Kant's argument that the rules that govern our collective political life ought not to be enforced unilaterally. So Kant, in his political philosophy, argues that it's normally wrong to unilaterally use force or coercion to impose one's judgments on other people, including one's judgments about justice, even if one's views are correct. Instead, he holds that legitimate enforcement requires a public authority whose use of coercion represents what he calls an omnilateral and not a unilateral will. And again, I'm going to argue that we should interpret an omnilateral will as an actual shared intention among a particular moralized domain of the state's constituents, people whom I'm going to call cooperators. So cooperators are those individuals who are willing to recognize and respect others as bearers of an equal claim to autonomy and independence and to acknowledge the political duties that flow from that. So the thought is that to be legitimate on this account, a state not only has to offer minimally just governance, it must also reflect cooperators' shared intention to establish justice through a particular institutional configuration. Okay, so I want to start by kind of briefly recapitulating a couple of the main elephant elements of Kant's theory of legitimate state authority, which I'm drawing on here. And I'm going to pass over this um, relatively quickly because I think by now that Kant's political philosophy is fairly familiar. I just want to argue, I just want to sort of isolate three main claims that are really going to be of central interest for my argument. So the first claim I call the natural duty claim. So Kant begins from the idea that just as human beings, we are subject to a fundamental natural duty of justice to respect other people's innate right from, to independence from our arbitrary will. And he calls this the right, the right to external freedom. So we have a duty to respect others' innate right to, to freedom. His second claim is that we cannot fulfill that natural duty without coordinating together in a state that can define and enforce one unitary scheme of more particular substantive rights, especially things like rights to property and contract um, that will bind us all. So our duties to do justice to others require us to respect things like their property rights and their contract rights. But in order to act on those duties or fulfill them, we need a kind of scheme of definitions of what everyone's property is. Um, and the state provides us uh, th th that those definitions of substantive rights um, that are necessary for us to fulfill our natural duty to respect others' freedom and independence. So the third claim here, and the one that's really of most going to be really of most interest for us today, I'm going to call the omnilateralism claim. So Kant argues that this public scheme of rights ought not to be imposed unilaterally. That is, it ought not to be coercively implemented by an agent who demands that everyone else conform to her own judgment of what justice requires and who privately enforces that demand. Instead, for its imposition to be legitimate, a public scheme of rights must reflect what he calls, again, an omnilateral will. That is, a set of judgments about the enforcement of justice that can be shared. 
So Kant argues on the one hand that we have this duty of justice to coordinate and get together in a state, but also on the other hand that we have to do that coordinating in a very particular kind of way, in this omnilateral, not this unilateral way. <clears throat> okay, so what exactly is wrong with the unilateral enforcement of justice? So to bring out Kant's uh, position here, uh, I'm going to uh, engage in a thought experiment, and I apologize for it. Um, I'm going to imagine a private individual in something like a state of nature situation, your neighbor, let's say, in the state of nature. Uh, and this private individual's interpretation of justice is substantively correct. So by that I mean she holds justified and true beliefs about everyone's moral rights. She knows what everyone's moral rights really are. And this individual is endowed with sufficient power to bring everyone else to successfully coordinate around her view. So maybe she's got a secret weapon that no one else has. So even though she could successfully impose a perfectly just scheme of rights by acting unilaterally, Kant's claim is that she's got some important reason not to do that. So the idea is that the fact that her judgments of justice are correct is not sufficient to grant her the right to force other people to comply with her decisions. Well, why not? What exactly would be wrong with unilateralism? Well, I want to argue that there, I think there are actually two problems with it. And one of them I see as being more fundamental than the other one. So the first one, I think, is a problem of social inequality. So unilateral enforcement sets up a hierarchical relationship between the parties that are involved in it. There's the powerful enforcer on the one hand, our neighbor in the state of nature with her secret weapon. And then there are all the others who have to obey the decisions that this powerful enforcer makes. Uh, and if we think certain features of egalitarian social relationships are, are intrinsically important and valuable, then we might worry that that kind of unequal power hierarchy would undermine a kind of egalitarian social relationship amongst people. So if we do believe that equal social relationships have a kind of intrinsic value, then that might get, give our powerful neighbor a kind of pro tanto reason to refrain from unilaterally enforcing her judgments of justice. Uh, even, even when they are correct. But the second, in, what I, in my view, is the mo more fundamental problem, is a problem of lack of autonomy. So when one person uses coercion or force to impose her judgments of justice on others, she supplants their rational autonomy, their capacity to reason out for themselves what they are to choose and do. Yet an important part of treating other people as autonomous agents involves respecting them as rational deliberators. But the unilateral enforcer is insensitive to the need to engage her fellows in that kind of way. She doesn't offer them any reasons that might lead them to share her point of view about what everyone's substantive rights are. Um, and she doesn't inquire into or respond to the reasons why they might not share it. Instead, she just imposes her judgments by force, leaving the others powerless to do anything but go along. So as I said, I think this autonomy worry about unilateral enforcement is the more fundamental one. This principle of individual autonomy holds that as rational agents, we ought to be able to direct our lives to a significant degree according to our own judgments. And that idea is thought to ground many of our most important basic liberties, like freedom of speech, conscience, association, privacy, and so on. But this value of autonomy is much less commonly thought to bear on the choice or enforcement of other regarding social rules. But I believe that the principle of autonomy does have implications uh, for the process by which we ought to make and enforce political decisions. It's important that political decisions be made and carry out, carried out in a certain way via the willing intentional agency of those who are subject to them. And if a set of rules is forced onto a population over their explicit objections and against their will, then the process of its imposition on this kind of view fails to adequately respect their autonomy. And that's true even if that set of rules sets up a perfectly just distributive scheme of rights um, and material resources. The process of unilateral imposition will also likely produce further derivative harms to this population. So people who are subjected to unilateral coercion will find their political institutions alienating. They will feel as though a kind of hostile force exercised near complete control over their lives. 
And they're also unlikely to experience the political world as one in which they have valuable relations with other participants or where they feel at home. So because it involves those kinds of important harms, I think that unilateral um, coercion is normally pro tanto wrong. By that, I mean that there's an important moral reason against doing it. Um, but I think that there is an important class of exceptions to this. So when someone refuses to acknowledge very basic elements of personal autonomy and independence, say someone attempts to, uh, assaults me and attempts to murder me, for example, um, that failure to sort of acknowledge my independence releases me from any reciprocal re requirement to respect his in return by refraining from unilaterally coercing him. So the requirement to refrain from unilateral coercion, on my view, holds only with respect to those people who are willing to acknowledge others as bearers of a fundamental claim to autonomy and independence. And these are the people who, on the handout, if you have it, I've termed, termed cooperators. So it's kind of a moralized domain of people uh, that I'm concerned with here. But so long as people are indeed willing to recognize others' independence, I think it's pro tanto wrong to coerce them unilaterally, even when, I think, even when their interpretation of the precise demands of our mutual independence is in some way mistaken. So the thought is that even when a person is kind of incorrect about what, my, what rights I have on the ideal view of what justice requires, if that person is trying to respect my rights, the rights that by his lights I have, he's not treating me with contempt. And there's an important moral difference, I think, in how I should respond to, that, to the person who doesn't treat me with contempt, even though he's mistaken, and the person who treats me with, with absolute contempt. I think the, um, that uh, for this person who's just mistaken, uh, his rational deliberative capacity places demands on me, and I should interact with him using persuasive and not coercive means. Second, uh, even where co unilateral coercion is wrong, even where we are dealing with a person who qualifies as a cooperator in my moralized sense, sometimes I think that this wrong can be outweighed. So if there's really no other way to secure very important social values, such as the essentials of justice and public order, then I think it is permissible, all things considered, to su subject some people to unilateral coercion in certain scenarios. So the thought is this is a, a weighty reason, uh, the reason to refrain from unilaterally coercing people, but it's not an absolute reason. And sometimes autonomy is one value among many, and sometimes other social values can outweigh it. Finally, I, th I want to say that I think that this autonomy worry about unilateral coercion is at the core of our complaints about colonialism. Now, I've already acknowledged that I think historically, as historically practiced, colonialism was wrong for a whole lot of reasons, uh, including human rights abuses, racism, and so on. But I think that unilateral coercion was one of its key wrong-making features. So a particularly destructive effect of civilizing colonialism, <coughs> for example, was the forcible imposition onto a subject population of a social order that bore no relationship to their own judgments about how they ought to be governed. And those who live through that kind of experience tell of a sense of powerlessness and a kind of loss of orientation and control. And that kind of act produced a lasting legacy of alienation among them, uh, which, is a, which is something that persists even today. So even in the best scenario we could possibly imagine, where colonial institutions are benevolent and substantively just, still they deny the autonomy of colonized subjects by disregarding their claim to shape their common life on the basis of their own judgments. OK, so while um, autonomy, I think, is fairly familiar in the personal context, it's a lot more unclear how it might be extended to the context of collective decision making. And so let me try to say a little bit more about what I take political autonomy to be. OK. So first of all, why might autonomy be an important value in the political context? Well, like others here, I think it matters that the characteristic means by which political rules are implemented is via coercion or force. So coercion poses a presumptive threat to rational autonomy because it deprives the coercee of the ability to carry out her own authentic practical judgments. 
Instead, she finds herself in circumstances that leave her no reasonable option but to act in the way that her coercer wishes her to act. And that substitutes the coercer's judgments as to how she should act for her own, depriving her of self-directed agency. And autonomy, as I understand it, is particularly threatened by what I'm going to call alien coercion. And by that I mean coercion that really bears no relation to the priorities and the values of those who are subjected to it. So when someone is pervasively subject to alien coercion, substantial aspects of that person's life can come to seem hostile, threatening, and completely beyond her grasp. And in that kind of a scenario, it can be difficult to maintain any sense of oneself as an agent who charts her life in accordance with her own purposes. So the importance of this political analog to personal autonomy, I think, lies in mitigating that threat of alien state coercion. So where the state's use of political power reflects its subject's own judgments as to how they ought to be governed, they are enabled to relate in a distinctive way to that state and to the constraints that it imposes on them. So because the subject can see the point of those coercive demands in terms of judgments that she herself is in part committed to, then she also sees reason to hold herself to those demands. And here, the state is no longer an overwhelming alien power, but rather a tool that allows her to more effectively carry out practical commitments that are her own. So I want to suggest, then, that there is an important autonomy interest in enjoying what, to borrow a term from uh, some recent work by Nico Kolodny, I'm going to call correspondence. So someone enjoys correspondence when her political institutions match her judgments in some way. So she lives under an institution that she endorses or accepts or believes to be justified or appropriate. And the importance of correspondence is not that congruence between subjects' attitudes and their institutions is intrinsically valuable, but that where it exists, it allows for individuals to experience a self-directed agency even while subject to coercive political power. Now you might object, and I think it's a good objection and one that I'm going to return to a few different times, that in a diverse political world, it's just impossible that political institutions could reflect each individual's judgments. And of course, that's right. No individual's personal judgments can be mirrored by each and every political decision. And indeed, this idea that we have a duty to coordinate omnilaterally seems to suggest that to demand that every uh, decision reflect your own judgments would fail to respect that duty, would fail to extend other people adequate consideration. But a diversity of political opinions does not make correspondence impossible, in my view. So there is a second order sense in which individuals' priorities are often reflected in group decisions and even in those particular decisions with which she disagrees. Namely, when that individual shares a commitment to a cooperative enterprise and to certain shared values and procedures by which she believes that enterprise should be structured. So on this kind of view, a commitment to, to participating in collective political action is very important in enabling correspondence. So consider, for example, a partnership that's undertaking a kind of small-scale joint venture, say a group of people who want to run a coffee shop together. Now, several different philosophers have offered theories of the kind of joint agency that's involved in those cases, arguing that it's undergirded by a structure of shared intentions. And beyond sharing intentions, it's also likely that as they cooperate over time, this group will develop certain shared commitments about how their enterprise ought to run. And that, that doesn't mean that all the partners are going to just converge in their first order judgments. That's very unlikely. More probably, they're going to divide on certain issues. But even when we do not converge in a small scale group enterprise like this, partners are often able to generate shared commitments that are not reducible to their own first-order judgments about how their joint venture should go. And these kinds of commitments can unify a group even when they diverge in their views on specific issues. Once those kinds of shared commitments have developed, members will generally act on them and they'll feel entitled to expect the others to act on them. And because a group can develop shared commitments, over time they can even evolve a kind of group standpoint that standpoint consists of a set of core values and priorities about how the group is going to make decisions and organize more specific plans of action. The group's standpoint won't fully correspond to any one particular person's first order views about what to value or what's important. 
But still, each member can accept the group's standpoint and share in it, so long as he intends to participate in their joint venture. So I think there's a perfectly straightforward sense in which we can speak of a small-scale partnership like this coffee shop group as sharing a will. So their shared will is just to cooperate together in running their coffee shop and to license the values and priorities that make up their group standpoint. So on, on the view that I'm proposing here, a shared will is nothing more than an interlocking structure of cooperative intentions on the part of each participant amid, amid a kind of common sense on the part of all that those intentions obtain. So to, to provide another illustration of what I have in mind here, um, I, I want to take the example of my own department's hiring decisions. So this may reveal a little too much, but while I often disagree with my colleagues about who we should hire, I prefer that we should make our hiring decisions together through our accepted consultation processes, even though I know that that's going to mean recognizing some decisions with which I disagree. Indeed, I'd actually feel myself disrespected if the dean were to overrule our collective decision, even if what he did was to impose my first order preferred candidate. So even though our hiring decisions do not always correspond to my first order preferences, there's still a very important second order sense in which my priorities are reflected in those decisions. I share a commitment to a valued cooperative enterprise together with these colleagues and to certain kinds of shared policies by which I think that enterprise ought to be structured. So the idea is that participants can freely accept their group's policies and the outcomes that result from them, even when they disagree with those outcomes, so long as they share a commitment to a collective political venture and to the values and procedures that structure it. And the objects of those shared commitments need not be anything like uh, first order political decisions. They can be fairly abstract ideals and procedures of the short sort that might typically be enshrined, say, in a constitution. And when individuals together share those kinds of collective commitments, I'm going to say that they share a political will. So much more can and no doubt should be said about this controversial idea of a shared political will. But for now, because I don't have so much time, I just want to stress the important role that a group's shared political will plays in ensuring this value I've called correspondence for the members. So when each member participates in a group's shared will and the government imposes laws and policies that reflect that shared will, then this use of political coercion will not be alien to the members. So even though she may not personally endorse every political outcome, each member is governed in accordance with political values and institutional procedures that she does endorse. So the thought is that coercion in accordance with an omnilateral will, remember this Kantian concept, differs from alien or unilateral coercion because it's based on a joint intention in which each cooperator shares to act together to establish justice through particular institutions. So even though correspondence is ultimately an interest of individuals, it, can be, is it, it is an interest that can be furthered through an individual's membership of a self-determining group to the extent that that individual affirms her participation in the group and endorses the values and procedures that structure that group. So in that case, then, rule by the group's institutions will be in the service of the individual's interests in self-directed agency and in non-alienation. OK, uh, to be valuable, though, I want to suggest that correspondence has to meet four additional conditions. So first of all, correspondence only serves people's autonomy under conditions where a shared political will is freely formed in a way that's accountable to, to individuals' own authentic deliberative processes. So if rulers, say, instead manipulate their subjects' political judgments through deception or brainwashing or, or um, uh, you know, subliminal <laughs> advertising or something like that, then correspondence is not going to promote the subject's autonomy. So in that kind of a case, subjects will be just instruments of their rulers' judgments and not their own. Second, correspondence between a group's political will and their institutions has to come about through some kind of a causal process. So a group might enjoy correspondence just due to the kind of goodwill of a benevolent dictator who always gives the people what they happen to think is right. But in order to ensure self-determination, a government has to robustly reflect its citizens' shared will 
And that's going to require some kind of channel by which a, uh, a people might revoke authorization of the government if it were to cease to reflect their shared will. And third, correspondence is valuable only for a restricted domain of constituents and for a restricted domain of their judgments. So again, the reason correspondence is valuable for us is that it promotes a certain interest in autonomy that we have. But autonomy, as I conceive it, has a private as well as a kind of public dimension. And political autonomy has moral weight only when it's consistent with at least basic elements of personal autonomy and independence. So I'm going to stress here again that the popular will that a state ought to represent is a will that is shared among cooperators, namely those individuals who are willing to recognize and respect others as bearers of an equal kind of private right to independence. So there's no requirement, again, to refrain from unilaterally coercing non-cooperators. And finally, the state has reason to respond only to a restricted domain of cooperators' judgments, namely their judgments concerning the appropriate way to establish justice together, not their judgments concerning a whole range of other matters like uh, religion, culture, the good life. So again, an omnilateral will is a will concerning how a group is going to coordinate together to define and enforce their more substantive rights. It's not a will that concerns um, a broader range of religious, moral, or cultural values. So in that sense, the state does not need to strive for congruence with all its subject's judgments. So why care about correspondence, once again, even for this, what I've now said is a restricted domain of agents and what is a restricted domain of their judgments? Well, unless we suppose that a state does reflect the shared will of its people in the way I've suggested, it's difficult, at least for me, to see how, we, how a state could ever solve this problem of unilateral coercion that I've said was characteristic of a state of nature. The problem of unilateral coercion is a problem of deciding for others what justice requires and compelling them to submit to one's judgments. Uh, and as that state of nature neighbor case illustrated, that's supposed to be a problem even where the coercer's judgments of justice are correct. But if unilateralism is a problem for private individuals in a state of nature, like the neighbor, then it's also a problem for the state. So what makes the state's enforcement of a system of rights, even an objectively correct and just system of rights, any less unilateral than a powerful neighbor's enforcement of justice in the state of nature. Well, the, the, the main difference, I submit, is the fact that the cooperators amongst its population affirm that state's procedures and institutions, judging this to be an appropriate way to decide and enforce justice among themselves. And in that way, they grant the state a kind of special standing to decide on their behalf. OK, so it's still natural, the objection that I pressed before, I'm going to come back to it again. It's still natural, I think, to continue to want to object to my account that however desirable this ideal of political autonomy that I've outlined might be, it's just unachievable. Uh, and that's because this ideal suggests that a legitimate government should in some way reflect judgments that are shared by its subjects. And for that to be possible, then those subjects have got to share something. They've got to share some attitudes or values. But we know that groups almost never agree on anything in politics. So it seems extremely unlikely that any kind of territorially defined population is going to achieve unanimity of the, of the kind I'm, I've, I'm suggesting. So does that render political autonomy a kind of illusory ideal? So I don't think it does. And in developing my kind of second pass at this worry, uh, I want to briefly also say something about the implications of my view for this who is the self question and also for the question of secession and autonomy for in internal um, minorities. So as I've stressed throughout, there is a reason to ensure a kind of fit between state institutions and the shared will only of this restricted domain of cooperators, that, namely those people who are, who are committed to showing respect for the independence of others. And I think there's some essential elements of that commitment. Um, so first of all, a willingness to define a scheme of private rights that meets the conditions of what, uh, what I'm going to call basic justice. And second, an acknowledgement that that's going to require coordinating together in a territorially defined state. So the thought is that claims to self-determination are necessarily moralized claims. Even to begin to make a case that a group might be owed self-determination, that group's going to have to meet certain moral requirements. <coughs> 
And second, I remind you once again that I hold that the, the requirement to respect self-determination is not an absolute one. Sometimes there is, uh, it, it is permissible to subject some people to alien coercion if that's the only way to achieve social goals that are of truly overriding importance. So even where there is some kind of a wrong in alien, in alien coercion because it disrespects certain people's autonomy, sometimes that wrong is outweighed by other more compelling social values. So I want to sort of unpack that fairly abstract idea by kind of outlining and discussing three paradigm cases of dissent where there's some kind of lack of correspondence between state institutions and the shared values and judgments of some subpopulation of that state's constituents. And in the first two categories of case I'm going to discuss, I'm going to argue that it's permissible to subject those dissenters to alien coercion. Uh, in the third kind of case, though, I'm going to say, say that dissenters have a claim to greater self-determination and that political institutions may have to be uh, uh, reconfigured to accommodate them. So in my first paradigm case, dissenters lack correspondence only because they refuse to acknowledge a duty to cooperate on minimally just terms. And as I said, I think that there is some basic content to what could properly count as a recognition of the foundational duty to show respect for others' autonomy, private autonomy and independence. At the very least, it requires a willingness to coordinate together in a legitimate state that could enforce a scheme of private rights that protects security, subsistence, the fundamentals of personal autonomy, including things like freedom of conscience and thought, personal property, and the freedom to form family relationships, and certain preconditions for the society to exercise collective self-determination, including freedom of expression, association, and the freedom uh, to publicly, politically dissent. So when we're faced with alienated groups that, um, whose values are incompatible with those requirements, uh, you might imagine groups like race, racists or fascists or theocrats, then I think we can only say your alienation must be discounted because any greater recognition for your values in our institutions is not compatible with hold, upholding uh, basic justice for other people. There, is, there are also dissenters who's, um, who are alienated because their values are in some way incompatible with acknowledging other people's equal claims to political autonomy. So for example, at the moment of, de moment of decolonization, many British imperialists were disaffected that they couldn't go on living in the glorious British empire, right? So we might wonder, well, is their alienation a reason to coerce, say, the Indians to continue to be ruled by the Raj? Uh, no. Um, and I believe that individuals have claims to live their own lives, including establishing institutions that reflect their values and priorities, with, so long as those values are, fall within the boundaries of their duties of justice to others. So using coercion to force a dissenter to uphold someone else's identity without any kind of further justice-based rationale for that use of coercion is, on this kind of view, wrong. And that means that if recognition for one person's values would involve forcing the unwilling cooperation of another person, under conditions where that cooperation is not required by justice, then the former person's dissent just has to be discounted. So those kinds of scenarios make up my first paradigm, which again are, are cases where dissenters in some way refuse to recognize the equal autonomy of others. And that discussion again illustrates that claims to self-determination have to be understood as moralized claims. In cases where dissenters refuse to acknowledge others' basic rights, refuse to recognize a duty to cooperate in a legitimate state, or refuse to respect other people's equivalent claims to political autonomy, then we can override their values and priorities without any kind of moral loss. A second kind of paradigm case where I think dissent can also be overridden is one where dissenters' priorities might be compatible with others' rights and principle, but they're not in practice due to institutional infeasibility constraints. So on this kind of a view, groups that are capable of demanding, of claiming self-determination, uh, they need to be able to, to organize themselves territorially in representative institutions. And they're going to be some small and dispersed, uh, disaffected minorities, you might imagine, I don't know, socialists in the US, who are going to be unable to satisfy that kind of a condition. Maybe, the, actually, maybe, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe, that's a, maybe, maybe there are more of them than I realize. Um, 
But I want to appeal here to, to the importantly territorial dimension of our natural duties of justice. So we can't establish a unitary interpretation of property and contract rights and enforce those rights and punish violators unless people who live in proximity and interact regularly are subject to the same institution. So if disaffected ideological minorities refuse participation in any kind of feasible territorial uh, institution, then I think their alienation has to be overridden. And this is a case where there is some kind of disrespect, in my view, to their autonomy. Uh, but I'm going to stress here again that self-determination is not an absolute value. Where respecting it would entail very, very grave social costs by, say, making it impossible to achieve a minimally just and functioning legal order, then it can be permissibly outweighed. So I'm going to conclude now by saying something about my third paradigm case, which is the one where I think we are morally required to reconfigure institutions in a way that might grant groups greater self-determination. And here, I have in mind a kind of subset of groups with shared political commitments that are, first of all, consistent with the provision of basic justice for other people. Second, who possess or could form a territorially organized structure of representation. And third, whose dissent can be feasibly addressed at reasonable cost by granting them separate institutions. And in explaining this kind of case, I'm also by way of explaining this kind of case, I'm also going to say something about the implications of this view for the issue of defining the self in self-determination. So most theories, as, as I think should be familiar, begin by defining peoples uh, when they give an account of self-determination. And they define peoples with reference to certain kinds of shared characteristics, like language or culture or interlinked interests. And I want to resist that approach. Instead, in a way I'm going to try to explain, on my view, the constitution of the people is endogenous to existing institutions. So I think a people is born only when individuals engage together in institutionalized political cooperation and they come to value and endorse that cooperation. So by unifying individuals through a structure of representative institutions, the state brings into being a kind of corporate group in whose name it purports to act on the world stage. But for the state to genuinely represent a self-governing people, I, I think it, it, it needs to not only sort of exist as an institutional structure, its institutions also have to receive uptake uh, from ordinary citizens who come to willingly support and participate in those institutions. So if the members of an institution do intentionally participate in its representative structures, willingly acting together to implement their decisions and uphold their common procedures and political values, then a self-determining people is born. But if members don't intentionally participate, but instead are simply coerced into submission by this institution, a state may exist on the territory, but there is no people that that state could be said to represent. So on this endogenous view, there's really no independent criterion for delineating peoples beyond the fact that existing political institutions as we know them either succeed or fail at eliciting this kind of willing participation from the populations that they currently rule. It's important to note, though, especially in considering the claims of alienated minority groups, that intentional participation is often partial. Sometimes much of a population signs on to a state's institutions, but some subgroups within it fail to willingly support and participate in it. And when that happens, I believe that that state's rule over some of those alienated subgroups may be illegitimate. So what makes the constitution of the people endogenous on this approach? Well, in defining the people, we should look to the patterns of affirmation and alienation that emerge as artifacts of kind of our, our, structure, our existing structure states. And we then ask, are there feasible institutional alternatives that are consistent with the provision of basic justice that might afford alienated groups greater political autonomy? And we delineate a new people when we do, not because we're recognizing something that already independently exists out there in some pre-political sense, but because we have some reason to hope that this kind of an institutional reconfiguration will lessen alienation at reasonable cost. So on this approach, the process of constituting the people is never really finished and done once and for all. 
The people is instead a mutable entity and negotiating and renegotiating uh, negotiating our institutional arrangements is a kind of process that we can expect to be an ongoing one. So this sort of endogenous view of the people, I think, implies that sometimes persistently alienated minorities will have a right to redraw jurisdictional boundaries in a way that affords them a kind of separate political, uh, political sphere. Now, under current international law, that's not actually thought to be the case. The right of self-determination is seen as limited only to overseas colonies. Sometimes this idea of a salt water thesis is invoked. There has to be a body of salt water separating uh, the group claiming uh, self-determination from the kind of overarching state. Uh, and also populations under uh, foreign military occupation or apartheid government. So contrary to this international legal consensus, I think that sometimes persistently alienated internal minorities who are in fact territorially cont contiguous with the overarching state will um, sometimes have a right to redraw jurisdictional boundaries. So unlike some theorists then who argue that self-determination is only a remedial right against a government who pers that persists in grievous and serious human rights abuses or other kinds of injustices, I think an alienated group can sometimes claim self-determination even when they have not been unjustly treated. But I want to stress two caveats to this sort of view. So first of all, I don't think self-determination necessarily implies a right to secede unilaterally, as just occurred today. Uh, and second, in my view, self-determination is a kind of weighty moral claim that has to be applied with due regard for circumstances. So it doesn't always generate a right to secede, and sometimes it's permissible to override it, at least temporarily. So first of all, I think the claim to self-determination is not always best satisfied through an independent state. Arrangements like internal autonomy or devolution can be appropriate vehicles for self-determination in many circumstances particularly where there are significant minorities on the territory claimed by the alienated group, where secession would carry high costs to others, and especially where the group has no grievances that go beyond alienation. So they haven't been any victims of any kind of current or historic injustice or denial of political representation. And second, even when there is a, a good moral claim to self-determination, I think sometimes there are also good reasons on the other side that tell against it and may be able to override it. Uh, at least temporarily. So, for example, if recognizing a group's claim to self-determination would lead to civil or international war or ethnic conflict or serious human rights violations or where the cost of the demanded institutional reform are just so great as to uh, jeopardize the importance of other very important state function, the performance of other very important state functions, then I think that, that those can be good reasons for outweighing the claim to self-determination. So, Self-determination is not the only political value, uh, and we're often going to need to kind of weigh it up against other competing values, including and very centrally the need to, to achieve a stable and minimally just legal system. Still, though, there are, I, I, I do want to argue that self-determination is a weighty value, and that there are some circumstances where these competing concerns are not going to be present in such force as to override it. And those are going to be scenarios, especially scenarios, where it's feasible for the overarching state to negotiate greater political autonomy at relatively low institutional risk. So examples of this include things like the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act in this country, when the US Congress ended 50 years of direct federal control over Native American affairs, or decolonization after World War II, which dismantled the great colonial empires, or Canada's creation of the province of Nunavut for its Inuit minority in 1999. So this kind of political autonomy view cautiously supports e efforts to extend the principle of self-determination to new contexts and new groups, including indigenous peoples and internal minorities. And I don't think it ought to be viewed as a matter of pure discretion um, whether the state grants autonomy to its internal minorities. States that continually reject their minorities' peaceful demands for self-determination ought to be subjected to some external international pressure to recognize their claims through things like naming and shaming, say, or imposing conditions on that state's membership of important international organizations. So I want to conclude then by saying that I think that this political autonomy account does provide some support for the notion that's so widespread today in our contemporary politics 
that self-determining groups have a right to control their own affairs and to decide some political matters for themselves. And I think this value of self-determination is an important part of why we have moral reason to favor a system of separate states, say, to a single world state. I also think it's the violation of self-determination that explains what's wrong with even benevolent colonialism and involuntary annexation. And I hope to have shown that, that uh, endorsing this principle doesn't rest on embracing illusions about individuals' capacity to control political decisions. And I also don't think it needs to involve our embrace of a kind of cultural nationalism or a, an incoherent theory of the pre-political people. But finally, and I think most important to me in giving this talk, is that I hope I've shown why it is that we should think of self-determination as a weighty value that we ought to prioritize in the design of our domestic and global political orders. So individuals who share a political will can establish and enforce justice through a joint exercise of self-directed agency, rather than being subjected to external commands by force. And when a state does reflect its people's shared will, then its use of coercive power is not hostile and dominating to them. And that's because its subjects affirm its standing to decide and enforce justice on their behalf. So because of that connection with rational autonomy, I think the desire not to be alienated from a political enterprise is more than a mere whim or preference. Rather, it's, it's linked to a significant human interest in self-direction in setting one's purposes for oneself. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, I have the pleasure of responding. I think I'm also going to be the chair of the Q&A session afterwards. Um, so uh, I'm going to give some comments first, um, and then if you wish, you can say something. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on to that. So first of all, um, I should say thank you for a really, really wonderful lecture. Um, I think it was great. Uh, not only because of its uh, philosophical content, but also because of its um, timeliness, but principally because of its philosophical content. Uh, <laughs> I personally think the, the move in the discipline to develop um, certain strands of non-contractarian or non-voluntarist political philosophy is very important, um, and your work as a whole has been central to that. Um, so for that reason, among others, I'm delighted to have the privilege of giving some comments um, this evening. Um, and I should say, too, that I find myself in broad agreement um, with your approach um, and with many of your particular claims um, about the value of autonomy and, and the importance of the creation of an omnilateral will. Um, but I ultimately want to raise a question about exactly how far your argument takes us when we start thinking about claims of self-determination and subsequent um, claims of independence. Uh, so I'd like to begin, if I can, with a sort of a Cliff's Notes version of what I take to be the core argument um, and the three main claims that make it up. But I've taken some license here in formulating it, so you'll have to correct me if I misstate your view. Um, so firstly, uh, cl first claim is that individuals have a strong moral interest in what you call second order correspondence, i.e. living under a system of joint regulation with respect to matters of justice that they endorse, accept, or believe to be justified or appropriate. Um, secondly, that achieving second order correspondence requires that we be cooperators, um, which minimally means that we must be people who jointly intend to create uh, and or sustain such a system of joint regulation. By cooperating in this way, we create a joint or omnilateral will. Um, and then thirdly, to become cooperators rightfully, or in other words, to meet the moralized demands of cooperation and so to form a rightful joint political will, we must meet several further moralize conditions of cooperation, um, principally that we must recognize and respect others as bearers of an equal right to independence. Um, but then there are also the four additional condi conditions that you give, um, which are that we must form a joint will freely uh, in a way that's accountable to everyone's deliberative processes, that we must be able to collectively revoke our authorization, that's a causal condition, um, that the subject domain of cooperation ranges only over these moralized cooperators, and that the content domain ranges only over matters of justice as opposed to matters of morality, religion, or culture. Um, so I want to make some comments about each of the three main claims, if I can. So the first one, again, individuals have a strong moral interest in second-order correspondence. Um, this, the, the first comment may just be a quibble. Um, but regarding the issue of correspondence, it doesn't sound like correspondence as such is what matters here, um, which is to say, 
uh, that I think what matters intuitively isn't that my values and priorities with respect to justice correspond to or match up with those of the institutions under which I live. It's that I do the things you mention, endorse, accept, or believe to be justified or appropriate the priorities and values of these institutions. Um, so I might endorse the institution because its commitments correspond to mine, and perhaps only if they correspond. Uh, but the morally important fact seems to me to be that I endorse the institution or the attitude I take towards it, um, not that it happens to agree with me in some particular way. Um, more substantively, I might also like to hear more about the nature of the second order values and principles in question when you discuss second order correspondence. Um, on one interpretation, uh, which at times you suggest they'd be uh, just the sort of procedural values and principles, um, like appropriate procedures, voting representation, maybe petitioning, and so on. Um, but it's not clear to me that disagreement over these matters would cover many of the cases of self-determination that we're interested in. So Quebecois, Catalans, maybe even Uyghurs and Tibetans, um, and so on, are arguably not in disagreement about voting or other procedures as such when they make claims of self-determination. Um, their concern, insofar as it has to do anything with voting would seem to be about who gets to vote um, or otherwise who, who gets to have a say on matters concerning them, um, not about whether voting is the appropriate mechanism. Maybe that's too narrow an interpretation. Maybe procedural values and principles aren't the second order things or the only second order things that are relevant. But even a more expansive list, such as one that includes fundamental rights and liberties, uh, and maybe other matters of basic justice seems to me to face a similar problem. A group making a claim to self-determination might share a view about the right list of basic rights and so on with the larger group of which they are part and which they wish to leave, um, and nonetheless continue to press their claim of self-determination. Again, um, this, it, insofar as they can make that claim, it seems that it's because the issue is not so much the structure of the political community as its membership. Uh, the question for a person concerned with self-determination has to do with who rules over them or who um, is a member of the ruling community, not necessarily with the content of the rule. Um, so my challenge here, then, at the risk of sounding repetitive, is just that it seems that in some cases in which the claim to self-determination um, is at least intuitively plausible, second-order correspondence isn't what's at issue. What's at issue is the domain of people who, enjoying second-order correspondence, get to govern themselves. Or, to state this re returning to your original formulation, um, when you write that people must, or when you say that people must be able to endorse, accept, or believe to be justified or appropriate the priorities and values of the institutions under which they live, the matter of their endorsement may have most to do, their endorsement may have most to do with the consistent constituency of those institutions and less to do with the institution's specific procedural or substantive commitments. Um, now separately, and this may be more of a technical issue, uh, it's not clear to me that first and second order concerns are fully separable. Um, since my, for some people, uh, imagining me to be one of them, my endorsement of various procedures like voting might depend on my view about their success in realizing substantive first order commitments um, that I value and prioritize. But if my endorsement of second order matters depends on my first order endorsements, it's not clear that I can actually endorse those second order matters regardless of the first order outcomes, um, which is what you suggest happens when we create a shared political will and what you suggest is necessary in order for us to be able to create a shared political will. Um, so if there are some instrumentalists about procedures of this kind, then it may undermine your claim um, that shared second order correspondence is possible. Um, the second main claim in my version of your argument is that achieving second order correspondence requires that we be cooperators, um, where I minimally understand that to mean people who jointly intend to create or sustain a system of joint regulation of political affairs. Um, and here, I just want to point out something that you do emphasize at various points, um, but that I fear might still be partly obscure which is that there's an important conceptual distinction between what's required of cooperators in order to form a joint intention, and so a joint will, and uh, separately, what's required of them as a matter of morality when we discuss questions of the claim of such groups to self-determination. So the non-moralized conception of cooperators, or just perhaps the non-moralized aspect of what it means to cooperate, would seem to require only that a set of people in fact jointly intend to accomplish things as a group. But this, of course, is compatible with many ends of that intention, including ends that you and we want to rule out. So a group might jointly intend to form a government based on a racist or colonialist view of the superiority of themselves to others. It might jointly intend to conquer or otherwise harm others. 
might intend any number of ends, both more and less objectionable than these examples. So cooperation as such only gets us a joint will. It doesn't get us one that's worth respect by others, um, much less worth granting rights of self-determination to. So why, do I, why am I bringing up this conceptual distinction? Um, I think it's important for two reasons. One is that uh, you sometimes talked as though the moralized conception of cooperators, which does rule out these objectionable ends, is part of what it means to be a cooperator. Um, but you also talk as though what it means to be a cooperator is to be able to form a joint will that achieves second order correspondence. And these are two, I think, very distinct senses of what it is to be a cooperator. And if they aren't sharply distinguished, it may seem as though the moral requirements you set for cooperators flow from the concept of cooperation uh, to form a joint political will, which I don't think is the case. The moral demands I don't think come from what it means to be able to jointly share an intention. Um, second reason to care about this distinction is that once we see the moralized conception of cooperators doesn't flow strictly from what it is to cooperate, if I'm right, we can then ask what the grounds are for the moral constraints on cooperation. Um, and I think the constraints you do suggest, uh, which I'll turn to next, are, are independently plausible. Um, but uh, they should be independently grounded. Um, and so uh, we might want to see um, them independently defended. Uh, so the third claim is that to become rightful cooperators or to meet the moralized demands of cooperation um, and so to form a rightful joint political will, we need to meet a core condition on cooperation in the four additional ones. Uh, so centrally that we re recognize and respect others as bearers of an equal right to independence. Um, and then the, we must form the joint will freely, be able to revoke it. Um, and then uh, these, the domain restrictions, uh, the subject domain of cooperation is moralized cooperators, and the content domain is matters of justice as opposed to matters of morality, religion, or culture. So um, as I said, I think these are plausible independent conditions on rightful political coordination. But I'm less sure now how they, together with the other main claims I've brought up, help us think specifically about claims by groups to self-determination. So for instance, it seems as though your argument implies that merely wanting and, and subsequently jointly intending to self-determine if a group shares the desire to do so and is territorially located and capable of doing so is sufficient to ground what you called a weighty moral claim to allow them to do so. But I'm not sure that it is. So if you and I, um, imagining that we occupy some land in West Texas somewhere, uh, wanted to and jointly intended to rule ourselves, would that by itself give us a weighty moral claim to do so? Um, and then you know we can scale the examples up from there, uh, thinking about citizens of, of, although this is an unfair example, Waco, Texas, um, or what about Catalans, Quebecois, or Scots, who are members of relatively well-ordered democracies and have significant political autonomy already, but who nonetheless may want nothing to do with the broader political unions of which they're a part. I don't have a firm intuition on these latter cases, but merely imagining that the people want and jointly intend to govern themselves in such a situation, for me, doesn't by itself make me think they have a weighty moral claim to be able to do so. Um, this is especially the case, I think, when we think about cases like the you and me in West Texas case, um, because as you said at the beginning of the talk, Mill writes that it's not government of each by himself, but government of all, by, of each by all the rest um, that we have to that we should care about. Uh, you and me doesn't seem very different from each himself, um, and if we take Mill's point he, there, I wonder whether your account um, has the resources to acknowledge it. So to put sort of a, a point on this, and then I'll finish. Um, and uh, I should apologize since you did for I'm about to uh, engage in a thought experiment. Um, Consider the case uh, of a state that is and maybe always has been a well-ordered democracy with a just basic structure, or if, or if that's not what you want, imagine your favorite ideal um, political society. And now imagine that some territorially located subset of people in this state, uh, and we can complicate it a little. I think it's interesting you know, uh, in the Catalan case to think about it being economically important, but you know, we can so imagine that some territorially located subset of the people in the state forms a joint intention to govern themselves. They propose the exact same structure of government as the one they wish to leave. The same procedures, the same guarantees of rights, even the same laws, maybe. The difference is just that they prefer and jointly intend to be self-determining. Do we think that this group has a weighty moral claim on this basis to self-determination 
to independence or some kind of political autonomy. Now, I can see, and I think I agree, that a joint intention of this kind might actually ground some claim to self-determination. But I don't intuitively see that it would be a, a, a weighty moral claim. Um, and what this suggests to me is that in addition to such a joint intention to be self-determining, in order for there to be a weighty moral claim to self-determination, um, we might require some grievance or at least disagreement on matters of justice and possibly actually, although you rule these out, on matters of morality or cultural, culture. But if so, then that might take us a little farther away from your account than you'd like, and maybe a little too far towards the accounts of people like Alan Buchanan um, that you'd like to avoid, I think. Um, so those are my main comments. There's also the fascinating issue um, of your discussion of uh, endogenous peoples, but I think um, I've probably been talking for too long, so I'll let other people ask about that if they like. Um, so with that, I'll say, once again, thank you for a really wonderful talk, um, and hand it back over to you. Thanks. Those are great comments. Um, so let me start with the last case, just because that's like an obviously you know really focuses the debate. Um, uh, so I agree with you that if um, if there's just a group of people that has kind of a whim that they'd like to govern themselves together, um, I, I agree with you that that doesn't seem. Um, sort of morally significant enough uh, to ground a claim. But I think that, so I think a group should have to show more than that. Um, but I, I do think that a group that is persistently alienated from the institutions that rule them over a, a significant period of time and could form uh, separate institutions does have a moral claim. And that's based on this idea, I think, that there is a problem with um, coercing unwilling people into submission. That's part of the, the, the logic underlying this account. So I think a little bit your example is trading on the idea of, is it you and me and our buddies together in the garage that got together on Saturday night and we're like, you know, we don't, we don't, we are not really alienated actually. We just kind of had this kind of neat idea. Let's, let's, let's do this. I don't think that actually is sufficient to ground a claim. But, um, but groups that, you know, that, that are indeed um, disaffected from the government that, that rules them for a si significant period of time, uh, I think they do. So, I, so the kind of procedural, so I haven't given a proposal for institutionalizing this, but, the, but I think the view would be compatible with, say, requiring um, uh, more than one vote and maybe sort of supermajority within a territory. So there needs to be a high level of kind of sentiment that we don't want to be a part of this state. And it needs to be sustained over a significant period. But I, I do think that um, I, I do think that part of the you know what's morally controversial about this view is that just institutions are not sufficient. There's a, another problem about how people relate to the institutions and where that relation is really absent. And it's absent in a persistent enough way and for a long enough period. Then I'm going to say it matters, even if it's you know West Texas. Um, so if West Texas were for 50 years to have strong movements about how they rejected US rule uh, and to have you know, a couple of popular referendums that showed that, they, that they, you know, they don't endorse US institutions, then I do think that that means that there's a kind of problem, prima facie problem. Again, it can be outweighed right? if there are other concerns that depend on our keeping West Texas with us, then that might be a reason not to let them go. But I think it gives rise to a prima facie reason to consider separate institutions for them. Um, so, and a lot of people are not going to agree with that. <laughs> uh, I understand that that is a controversial assertion, but it is something that I have come to think is important after thinking, I mean, I've changed my view on secession myself and, and self-determination over after thinking about it for, for a long period of time. Um, so, okay, so that's what I would say to that. To that. I'm going to go back to a couple of your other questions and I'm not going to, um, I think, fully answer everything. Um, one question that was important, though, was about my definition of, of cooperators and the way in which um, moral requirements figure into that definition. So the way I'm using the term cooperators in the paper uh, is as a term of art. Like, I actually don't mean to be using it just as the kind of, I, I mean it to have a definition, <laughs> um, not just the way we talk about cooperation in everyday life. Um, so the, my thought is that um, my view, actually, it's not, uh, so my view depends on 
um, a pretty thick ground level um, moral background principle. And that moral background principle is um, show respect for other people's rational autonomy and, and agency. And that applies amongst individuals as well. So I ought to show respect for your rational autonomy, which means that doing things like um, assaulting you or um, uh, denying your equal basic rights is a kind of failure to act on that uh, ground level moral requirement. So, so it, there is a kind of requirement of, of, of a thick moral requirement that's, that gets the, the, the theory off the ground and it applies sort of horizontally between individuals as well as with, between individuals and their political institutions. So, and, and what I thought was the more controversial interpretation of this requirement is that autonomy actually not only applies to kind of grounding horizontal equal rights between me and you, but also might require that we have institutions that in some way reflect a kind of um, collaborative project and not just sort of the sort of coercion of some into submission. So, so the idea is that there's kind of two, there's a single taproot, which is this requirement of respect for others rational autonomy, but there's two branches of the taproot. You know, there's a kind of, um, uh, we need to establish a state that respects um, equal private rights and implements those for people, but we also need to impose that state's political order in a certain sort of way, um, namely via this kind of omnilateral cooperative project and not via sort of unilateral imposition. So I, I thought of cooperators as kind of I did think of it as a moralized definition. It's not just people who want to get together and do something together. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps that part of the view is not sort of fully enough worked out, in the, especially in the talk that you read and the paper it's drawn from. I do say a bit more, but maybe even there, you know, I mean, there might be more that I need to do to defend that. Um, the, maybe one last thing I'll say about your comments, and I know I feel like I'm going on for too long, um, uh, is this issue about um, whether correspondence is the right way to conceive of what I'm really after. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so I do think that there is a we dimension to correspondence, and some of your examples um, flesh that out. It's not just that I want to live in institutions that reflect values X, Y, Z. It's also that I want to live in institutions that involve a we that pursues those values together through a certain kind of cooperative project. Um, so, uh, so I don't think it's sufficient to sort of just, you know, live under voting procedures that you affirm. Um, I, I often think these, these two dimensions come together. So I often think permanent minorities do really have political values that differ systematically along some dimension from the majority that rules them. So the Scots are systematically, say, more left wing. The Catalans have distinctive cultural priorities. And that's part of why they want their own institutions, because they do have some values that are distinctive. Um, but they also, there is also kind of a, a, a we dimension to correspondence. It's about a particular us per cooperating together to instantiate a certain kind of set of values and procedures. Um, so, and obviously that raises questions about the relationship of this view to nationalism and other kinds of views. Um, so maybe I'll just stop there. I know that's probably raised more questions than it's answered, but. Great. Um. I'm just going to go ahead and call on people. Uh, I'm going to try and make a, a cue. Um, so uh, maybe put your hand up until I acknowledge you. Um, and we'll start off here. And if you might introduce yourself as well, please. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm a postdoc in political theory at Tufts University. Um, I had a question and wanted to push on the idea that um, under conditions of political autonomy, the conditions that you lay out here, that when the government acts, that it, its actions reflect my omnilateral will. Um, so you could imagine, I, I, I agree with the US Constitution. I agree to be bound by it. I'm in a joint venture with other citizens of the United States. The government acts, and that government's action still may not be, even under the conditions of um, correspondence that you put on here, no manipulation or deception, uh, comes about through some causal process, it still may not reflect the majority view of the people who live in the United States government. It, it, there may not even be a majority view to reflect. And so when things like Obamacare get passed, even under these conditions, even with agreement about the U.S. Constitution, uh, 
we don't say, oh, that was my omnilateral will. Instead, we cry out and say, you know, Tea Partiers cry out and say, that wasn't what the people actually wanted. That w this is a misrepresentation. This is an usurpation of the people's will. And to push on it even further, it, it may not even be clear. They may go back and forth, back and forth, even while the government's policy stays the same. So it seems to me that often when the government acts, it may, um, we claim that it doesn't represent the people's at will, even when we agree to the conditions under which it acts. OK, um, good. So the way I don't, I do not conceive of an omnilateral will as um, a simple reflection of majority preference in government acts. Um, so, and it's also necessary for my account to work that um, you can have a kind of nested will. So something can reflect your will in some ways, but not in others. Um, so for example, um, and I, I think this comes, you know, I've done a little bit of work on kind of collective responsibility for state action. And I think this is one of the intuitions for those of us who think sometimes we are, bear some level of responsibility for what our government does. I think this is kind of where the intuition is coming from. So uh, I feel myself, differently related to, say, the war in Iraq than I do um, to, say, the war in the Ukraine. <laughs> um, and I feel, uh, I don't think I'm morally culpable for that war, but I do feel that I bear a connection to that war and that I may bear some proper share of liability to pay, say, reparations for the effects of that war. Why is that? Well, because I was party, I think, to certain kinds of shared intentions that enabled that war to happen, even though I disagreed with it very strongly. So for example, I held that the, I was party to uh, an intention that held that the properly elected government under US con constitutional procedures should assume office even when it was not the party for which I voted. And I was willing to cooperate with um, uh, properly enacted laws to pay my taxes that you know, paid for the planes that flew the missions in the war. So even though I disavowed the kind of for the, the first order goal of carrying out the war, I was party to a bunch of second order intentions that um, sustained institutions that enabled the government to carry out that war. And that, I think, is why I feel a sense of greater personal responsibility for that war. So yes, that war didn't reflect my will, we could say, um, in, in the first order sense. But yet, I do think that there is the second order sense in which my priorities were indeed reflected in that decision, in that I was quite willing um, and actually morally believed that I had certain duties to kind of cooperate in enabling the government to do that. Um, uh, so and I, think, I do think that we are kind of party to sort of certain shared institutional structures, even and, and willingly so often. And we often believe that we have, you know, that we are obligated to go along. Um, uh, and even when we disavow the first order outcomes. Um, great. Uh, Dimitri. Um, thank you so much for, for the talk. I thought it was very, very good. Um, I have a question that picks up on the last thing you said about how your view and nationalism have a, right. a, an interesting relationship. So something that's a feature of the view that's quite striking is the alien coercion you talk about at the start um, is from the individual's point of view. So it's just coercion from outside of the individual. Individual, It's not alien in a kind of national sense from a foreign political institution. And what's odd about that is most people in sort of commonsensical speak would distinguish right off the bat between coercion within the regime and coercion from a properly alien group. And the reason they're doing that, I think, on your view, is that in correspondence, the value they're building in is a value of something like the following, I prefer to be ruled by people like me, or something like that, where people like me is the national identity. And so the question I have is, to what extent, on your view, is that an acceptable value to undergird uh, correspondence? And it seems from your condition D on correspondence that it might be an un unacceptable condition. But I'm, so my question is also about what that condition spells out. So the condition says correspondence is valuable only for judgments concerning justice, not the good life, religion, or culture. And there's a kind of ambiguity in, in that. You might be saying something like only 
values that have to do with justice can constitute the values that, where, where correspondence exists. You also might be saying something, and if that's your view, then, then a, a value like, I would rather be ruled by people like me, is just unacceptable. You also might be saying something like, correspondence can only justify coercion insofar as it applies to uh, questions of justice as opposed to questions of morality or cultural imposition or something like that. And if that's what you mean by condition D, then the value, I would rather be ruled by people like me, is an acceptable form of correspondence uh, and so can justify national self-determination. Uh, and so, so that's, that's what my question's about, is whether or not that's an acceptable value. I mean, you might draw all sorts of principled lines. So you might say something like, in general, the value of I would rather be ruled by people like me is unacceptable if by that I mean white people or if by that I mean men. So there might be all sorts of people like me that are unacceptable. But in general, is it an acceptable value to underlie the correspondence that justifies the external coercion? It's a great question. Um, thank you for it. Uh, so I think I'm going to go for the latter option of the kind of ones you laid out. So I, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I take that to be is that I'm going to say that nationalist liberation movements or self-determination movements can, on my view, qualify for self-determination. Perhaps not for the reasons that they think they want self-determination, but for reasons of my own that have to do with this value of political autonomy. So typically, nationalist movements um, so anyway, nationalist theories of self-determination typically argue that um, cultural groups have a right to preserve themselves and that they can best preserve themselves if they can control the levers of the state to make sure that their culture is kind of reproduced over time. Um, so that's not the reason that I say groups are owed self-determination. Um, I appeal instead to this kind of relationship we have to um, bodies that exercise coercive power over us. But we might imagine an alienated national minority or something that is a cultural group and that is alienated from the institutions that are currently ruled them and might want to claim self-determination and they would have a prima facie claim on my view. So I'm, I'm not ruling out that national groups could qualify on my view. Um, uh, I think your, your question about wh what kinds of preferences would count is really interesting and can you rule out some but maybe not others. So, um, I, I do think there are some kinds of preferences uh, that kind of intrinsically deny the equal claims of others. <laughs> Racist preferences, for example. Um, they're an intrinsic denial of the equal moral status of others. And then there are other kinds of preferences that to me seem um, less objectionable. We'd like to preserve our language. That doesn't seem to rest on an intrinsic denial of the, the equal moral status of others. Um, so I am tempted to differentiate along, along those lines. So um, I, I think, um, so my, myself, I'm not a fan of cultural nationalism, but I'm not going to say that it could never kind of get in under my criterion. Um, I do have, I have a later, a, a chapter that comes after this one where I kind of develop more about my stance to nationalism. And one, one reason that I, I wouldn't want to consider myself a nationalist is that I think, I think there is a wrong in using this state to kind of reproduce one's culture as, when that involves imposing the culture on people who don't want to be involved in it. And I think that is a wrong because it fails to acknowledge their right to lead their life in their own way, which might involve not wanting to be a part of this cultural project. So, and I think many nationalist views actually ride on the idea that cultures can use the state in that way to nation build. Um, and I think there is a, an important kind of objection to nation building from a kind of justice-based point of view. Um, so I, th I think that nation building is often wrong, but I am going to acknowledge that national groups can sometimes qualify. I think we might have reasons to want to, if we were going to allow them to secede or to have their internal political autonomy, to want to qualify um, their kind of self-governance rights with reference to rights for minorities within their territory about in terms of language and other kinds of kinds of cultural, cultural rights. So I hope that was reasonably clear as, as far as your question. Um, down here in the front. Hi, uh, I'm 
Jeff Barons. Uh, I'm a professor in the philosophy department and sort of an outsider to uh, political theory. So sorry if this is naive or <laughs> misguided in some way. So I have a question that's about the functional, like the logical structure of the functionalist account and how it interacts with some of the objections that you raise against it. So it seems to me that it's going to matter um, whether the functionalist account, whether the sufficient condition is about um, whether the institution is governing in a way or would or could govern in a way. So if the sufficient condition is just um, you know, that you're governing justly and efficiently, then some of the objections seem like they don't apply because the, the principle is just silent about coming to govern. Mm -hmm. So some of the objections about colonizing or um, involuntary annexation, um, the principle just won't say anything about it. So maybe the correct way to understand the principle is that the institution has, has a right to rule if it does or could govern. Um, so I was understanding it in the first way. It's actually governing. Okay. okay. So, so then, one, one like problem, having colonized. Yeah. One, so right. one problem is so it's silent on how you get to be the governor. Right. Right. Um, but that seems to, uh, at least unless we add a, additional principles that have to do with how you get to be the governor, it seems to license the idea that um, suppose you come into power in what seems through some kind of involuntary annexation. So suppose... Um, you know, the U.S., for example, we, were, we occupied West Germany after World War II, right? right? Um, and we came into occupation, I'm going to suggest, through a just use of force. So we weren't there wrongly. Um, but suppose we just decided, okay, we're not going to let them go. We're just going to make them the 51st state. Um, uh, and we were willing to govern reasonably and whatever. Um, so the thought is that it's just effective control, then, um, that gives you the right to rule on that kind of view, with, unless you add further principles about how you come into to, um, to power. So if you're effectively in control and you do a decent job, then the functionalist is going to say, well, you have the right to, to rule. And that seems wrong in that it seems, at least in t from an intuitive perspective, um, it seems to allow for certain kinds of um, expansions <laughs> of your... A domain that we might want to want to rule out. So suppose the U.S. were to move its border, you know, ten miles into Mexico, and do a great job ruling it. Um, so we we effectively take control, and then we use our control well, and then it sounds like on the functionalist, that's all that's that suffices for having the right to rule. Am I not? Well, but the the I functionalist doesn't have to. <laughs> I mean, the functionalist has something to say about whether the, the move was permissible. Or, or put it this way, the functionalist has nothing to say about whether the initial expansion of the, of the borders was permissible, if, it's un, if the principle is understood in the, in the former way. Yeah. So, so I, I agree that there's, I mean, there's an objection here, which is that, hey, here's the state of affairs. It doesn't look um, objectionable precisely because of the way that it came about. So this is just a kind of, it might just be a minor point about the way the objection is framed. It's not that the principle licenses um, colonizing or annexing. It doesn't, it doesn't do that. Um, well, if, uh, so it depends on whether you take functionalism to be a full account of political legitimacy. So if there, if it is a full account, um, then it seems to me that it, it, may well license um, certain kinds of benevolent colonialism. So suppose you came into power perfectly justly. Everyone agrees. So U.S. occupying Germany. Yeah, right. That was so, OK, but, right? Or, right? Or certain kinds of humanitarian intervention. It's not like you came there in some procedurally wrong manner that we would want to rule out. Um, but it still seems like if we were to you know, do a humanitarian intervention in Haiti, which might be justified for some kind of temporary uh, purpose that it would it wouldn't we we ought not to annex Haiti and sort of politically incorporate them against against their will. So it seems to me, and it seems to me that the functionalist does not have the resources to explain why there would be an objection to that. 
Okay, I'm worried that we're talking past each other, but I'll just okay. well, give up for now. Maybe we can talk yeah, afterwards. Yeah, Because yeah. I clearly haven't fully appreciated what your, your worry is. Uh, there's an equally good hypothesis. <laughs> uh, All right, um, next up here. <laughs> um, my name's Jennifer London. I'm a fellow at the Software Center for Ethics. Thank you so much for this rich, fascinating talk. Um, my question was on if there's a positive account of justice that's constant in the project, or if there is variation in it that's contingent to the processes involved in collective self-determination. And at times it sounded like there was a positive account at the outset and that there were criteria or minimal criteria for justice. But it also seemed like that there was justice in the procedure of collective self-determination and how it takes place. Good, okay. Um, let me make a distinction between um, justice and legitimacy. Okay, um, so I actually think in maybe a somewhat sort of <laughs> unfashionable and possibly naive way that there is a right account of justice that, you know, I, I don't know that I have it, but I think that there, like, you know, once all the best reasoning comes in, that there are some right answers about what moral rights everyone should have, everyone has. Um, but I don't, but I also think um, that uh, it can sometimes be legitimate to impose and enforce a policy that doesn't match that best account of justice. And um, by legitimate, I mean uh, outsiders would have reason to defer to that um, uh, set of policies, uh, even though they weren't fully just. And insiders might have reason to work along or allow those policies to be implemented, even maybe while contesting them in certain respects to work for change or whatever. But they shouldn't like try to enforce some other set of policies. So um, the criteria that of omnilateral willing that I'm arguing for are are about legitimacy. How should we decide what to enforce? And the idea is sometimes we might decide, and rightly so, to enforce something that isn't fully just. And other people should respect that decision, even though it isn't actually fully just. They might want to like, try to persuade us that we should change our minds. I think that's totally permissible. But they wouldn't be entitled to come in and enforce some other policy. Um, so yeah, so I want to have it both ways, I guess. <laughs> Uh, is what I'm saying. And I also, I, maybe one other little wrinkle that's maybe lends a certain complication to my view is that I build into the legitimacy requirements certain, a certain account of what I call basic justice, which is it's sort of the thought that the legal system has to aim at doing justice, even though it might not get it right. And there's some minimal criteria that it has to satisfy in order to be reasonably interpretable as kind of pursuing the aim of justice at all, even under a mistaken view of what justice might amount to. Um, so yeah, so ultimately I end up saying that the legitimacy thing, which is the kind of lower threshold, is the thing that really matters in practice actually, much more. I mean, I think full substantive justice, we argue about that, we try to persuade each other of what that is, and there is maybe a right answer, but it's not, it doesn't, actually have that much to do with whether we should respect people's political decisions. Great. Um, I want to, I should have done this earlier, but I wanted to ask specifically if uh, Safra undergraduate fellows want to chime in. All right. <laughs> um, uh, next I have, um, I think it's Johan, right? Oh, thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, so I thank you for this talk, and I think because I um, think you argue very persuasively, I'm going to pick up on uh, the comment you made that you defend a principle that extends the value of self-determination to new contexts, mm -hmm. and I'm going to suggest a new context, and um, namely the economy, and uh, ask whether you think your principle is at all relevant here. Um, so uh, Elizabeth Anderson has argued, uh, I think, quite persuasively, um, recently two things, at least two things, that the firm um, has uh, power over their workers um, that are nearly as extensive and nearly as coercive as the state. So for instance, they can use the relation of dependence um, to curb workers' freedom of speech. They impose certain time schedule. They um, 
impose certain risks and importantly they also decide how to spend uh, the value that is created um, and also she has argued that the sort of possibility of exit uh, because for especially for low skilled workers it involves exiting one coercive firm uh, and entering another coercive and equally domineering firm um, the, the possibility of exit is as illusory as, illusory as the ex, the possibility of exiting a state. So, um, yeah, the, the question is really if um, you think um, your theory entails uh, some kind of democratic ownership over firms or some other way in which to extend uh, the principle of self-determination into the economy um, or if unilateral... Um, Coercion here is um, is is acceptable for for some reason. Oh, uh, so no, I don't think unilateral coercion is ever. I mean, it's not like it's not ever more acceptable in some sort of special gerrymandered domain. Um, I don't have a theory of how my view extends to the firm, so I'm a little like I I sort of want to say I think in principle it does, um, uh, and certainly you know I think in part I, I am very drawn like. There's a long socialist tradition of valuing collective self-determination um, and thinking that we ought to have collective self-determination when it comes to the conditions of our economic life. And I'm quite sympathetic to that tradition. Um, sometimes I think the state was viewed as a vehicle for exercising that kind of self-determination over our economic life, but there might be other, I, I mean, I, I don't know that I don't know that we have to see it as always tied to the state. There could be other vehicles for exercising collective self-determination that didn't go via the state. Um, and I think that would be an interesting project to think about. Um, so I think in principle, I'm quite sympathetic to the proposed extension. But I'm just not very good at making up a theory on the fly if I, didn't, if I haven't thought for a long time about it. You know, Because there, there are some relevant differences, I think, between the state uh, and, and an economy and, and the firm. Um, and that, that one would one would want to think about. Um, uh, so, for example, um, you know, you you might think that states um, states don't f face the same kind of like sort of profit environment and and kind of uh, imperatives of kind of shareholder <laughs> satisfaction and so on that uh, that firms do. And so, we might want to think about whether we should. That means we should thoroughly restructure the firm, and we want to aim at some sort of socialist ownership of the means of production or whether there's some way to kind of accommodate those imperatives and make them compatible with some degree of self-determination. So there's a lot of interesting questions. I don't know yet how they should be answered, but I'm certainly sympathetic to the, to the process of thinking them through. In the back, I'm sorry, I forgot your name from the earlier session. Thank you for your talk. I'm Brian Jones from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Um, I want to just, I think, maybe tie two things you said together in response to questions. The, um, you said that nation building is, is unjust. And I'm, uh, it's interesting because there's a tie-in, at least when you think of the second book of the Republic, Plato says that empire is unjust because it, it, it's grounded in being, it's uh, a sense of unlimited rule that the, uh, this is Plato's critique against Thrasymachus. So, um, and, and then you, you also said that something, I might be paraphrasing, you said something along the lines of claims about justice um, don't relate to claims about political legitimacy. Um, but it would seem that in the example you gave about uh, saying nation building is unjust, or even the example about your correct critique of um, you know, benevolent colonialism, it would seem that there, there's a kind of maybe uh, underlying sort of question, which is, you know, a more substantial account, or a, so what role does a substantial account of the good or human flourishing or how, however you want to phrase it play into this notion of political autonomy um, that, that, you, that you lay out? So thank you. Um. Right, so one thing, I think there may be two questions in there, or I'm gonna provide two answers um, anyway. So one thing is, I made that comment that I see nation building as unjust, and I also made a comment 
about the relationship between justice and legitimacy. So I, I, will, I will say something about where nation building stands on my view then. Um, so I think nation building is unjust uh, because, and by nation building I mean, I want to be clear here because you might mean different things by it, I mean um, the use of the powers of the state to impose linguistic or cultural uh, requirements on people. Um, uh, I think that's unjust because I think people have a right to choose uh, their own linguistic and cultural affiliations for themselves. And I think all the state can do is impose whatever kind of linguistic sharing we need in order to do justice to each other. But I think that actually leaves a lot of space for promoting other languages and having other kinds of cultural projects. Um, when I said I think it's an unjust, I actually do, I, I, I mean to refer back to that distinction between justice and legitimacy there. I think it's the wrong thing to do. I think states shouldn't do it. I think we should you know, contest and sanction governments that do it, but I'm not saying that a foreign power has the right to intervene if a state does it, or um, that we shouldn't respect um, the right to rule of states that do it. I think we should respect but criticize their policies. So I'm seeing it as not as lining up on the justice side of the justice legitimacy distinction. Um, and um, yeah, so that's an important, important fact. As far as what role in a substantial account of the good or human flourishing plays for me, um, it doesn't. <laughs> so I'm one of these kind of people who thinks that the state ought to be based on right and that right is different from the good and from human flourishing. And so, um, yeah, so I follow Kant in that kind of a view. Um, are we uh, up at the top of the hour? Is that Okay, so I have three people left and maybe uh, we should take all three questions sure. and then let you answer. Yeah. Okay, so um, first you, and then uh, two people in between, Gina and Katrina. <laughs> Julie and Kiara. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm uh, Liam. Hi, thank you for a very engaging uh, talk. I have two points, um, and both of which are kind of, I want to do kind of philosophically and then with a historical example. So the first point is, is a kind of a minor point. It's about the, um, the, the point about... Um, uh, I, guess, I guess paragraph three in, on your handout that you think about political uh, uh, political uh, autonomy account as an account which holds that in addition to providing good governance, the state should represent the omnilateral will of the people. And then I take good governments to refer to the second paragraph, so uh, governing in a reasonably just and efficient manner. Um, I don't think you care very much about efficiency or ruling in an efficient manner because that's tangential to these accounts of political autonomy. Uh, you may care about justice, ruling in a just manner, um, but then it may seem that these are that that kind of collapses into the omnilateral will of the of the of its people. Um, so I'm not sure whether it's distinct from the point you make about um, it, it having to be the omnilateral will of the people. And the example I have in mind is, for instance, in ancient Athens, where you have. Um, accusations of tyranny or the use of tyranny as equally a standard or an evalu uh, evaluative standard of political agency or political action, but also uh, a standard of collective identity. So you are non tyrannical insofar as you are just, but also insofar as you are part of the community or embody the collective will. So I'm not sure whether these are cl um, conceptually distinct. Uh, my second point is about. Um, the, the, the dichotomy you draw between um, political autonomy and alien coercion. Um, and I wonder whether we can kind of pry apart the, um, the uh, pry apart conceptually the alienness and autonomy. Um, and, you know, th this might be a very Skinnerian point, maybe, but um, you can imagine um, a society in which, you know, there's perfect correspondence between you know, the, the people or a large subsets of the people and institutions, but still there's a power above that kind of, um, that, that perfectly corresponding um, society which can arbitrarily intervene. And, and I think this actually also relates to your, um, your uh, characterization of uh, benign colonialism. Um, so you argue that um, kind of the, the colonial uh, attitude is the functionalist account of political legitimacy. Whereas actually we can also think about imperialism or colonialism as this form of indirect rule. So not uh, directly altering the, the, the institutions and kind of uh, having a, an alien uh, 
impact on them, but actually, you know, uh, imposing an institution that's perfectly correspondent and yet has to obey another, another power. Um, so those are my two questions. Uh, you want to take mom, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I would, I don't know if this is... No, I'm sorry. Um, if there are any, this might be a clarifying question. Are there any substantive constraints on how thin the correspondence can be in order for it to still have the values of omnilateralism? Mm -hmm. So I was, to take your neighbor example, let's say my neighbor and I jointly agree that for the first 10 years, I will unilaterally rule, and for the next 10 years, she will unilaterally rule, does that still count as an omnilateral decision such that it still reflects the value of autonomy? Um, and I think you could imagine similar types of questions about equality as well. So yeah, that's how, where are there, are there any constraints? How thin can the correspondence be? Uh, so I also had a question on correspondence, and I was wondering, in your view, um, what correspondence demands on the part of actually political officials rather than citizens. So I was thinking, for example, so there is a sense in which we may think that government reflect the judgment of citizens insofar as the content, the content of the decisions they make falls within the boundary of a mandate, say within the boundary of a constitution or within the boundary of a legislative mandate. But that's possible while, I mean, political officials could make decisions with the content for the wrong kind of reasons, right? Maybe they receive bribes or their donors want them to make that kind of decisions. So there is a sense in which, there is a weak sense in which in the first case, government still reflects the will of the citizens, but the causal connection is not sufficiently thick maybe to say that the government acts on the will of the people or at least acts on its own reason. So I was yeah, wondering whether you could clarify that. Um, good, okay. So, um, Liam, on your first question, I meant to distinguish the justice condition from the unilateral will condition. So, um, I think it's the case that, um, you know, you might imagine a benevolent colonizer who would, whose rule would be more substantively just, um, but they don't reflect the, the will of the people, and it might be better, all things considered, to have a regime that better reflected the will of the people and was less just. So, I, I mean these two to be... Um, distinct conditions. So the will of the people is about how the people relate to the institutions. Do they endorse and accept the institutions or not? The justice condition is whether they are, are on some objective measure just or not. Um, about your uh, Skinnerian point, maybe, there's, maybe this is indirect colonialism. We're letting you be autonomous for right now, but at any point, the colonizer could step in and, and take control, kind of like Spain is maybe doing this weekend. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I think that's an important point. I, I, I thought I, I meant to sort of at least refer to some constraints on that when I said that correspondence had to be robust and had to come about through some ca causal process. So um, I take it that if we have correspondence for right now, but our correspondence is very fragile and could collapse at any moment, that it, that's not going to be fully, that's a little bit like the benevolent absolutist who gives the people what they think right. Um, and he could take it away at any time. I said that was not enough. There had to be some way that the people, some mechanism that people could use to revoke authorization if that were to occur, and I think that would be also what I would say about the imperial power there. So Julie's question is really good, um, and uh, I'm not, uh, so, um, so here's something I didn't say in the talk that I believe and I say in the book the, from which this is drawn, which is I don't think this, is, this theory of collective self-determination actually requires anything like democracy. Um, so I, I think that it's possible that we could have a shared will that was freely formed and respected the conditions of basic justice, but actually authorized non-democratic institutions to rule. Um, and that's a little bit like your case where you, my neighbor and I agree that she's going to rule for 10 years and then I'm going to rule for 10 years. Um, I, you know, I, I think there are some worries about 
from an autonomy perspective, how long an agreement could you make to abdicate yourself to somebody's rule? And like, when do you have to, how frequently do you have to have the power to review this? Um, and I think some kind of like review power is necessary, actually. Um, uh, and I don't have an answer to how frequently. Uh, I mean, we worry from the perspective of individual autonomy about like contracts that like, like that are, that extend forever, you know, like if I were to, if there were, if we didn't have the ability to, to divorce and when I got married, I just signed up for life no matter what, I mean, we would worry from the perspective of, of domination and individual autonomy about that kind of a contract. I think similarly we would worry about if a people just abdicated its, its self-determination to a ruler without any possibility of review. But I, I think that some degree of abdication can be acceptable. I don't have a well worked out theory of what the time limits are. Um, uh, and then Kiara's question, um, I think it's good. I don't know if I have a great answer. So, um, so I, so let's, let, here are two poles of a view, both of which I would want to reject. Um, so one pole is that there's a constitutional structure that the people have authorized um, in some way. So they endorse the constitutional structure and there are some officials that are duly appointed in accordance with the proper values and procedures within that structure. And then those officials can just do whatever they want within their mandate no matter why they do it. And they don't have to give any further account of what they decide. I, I think that's too permissive and I agree with you that you know, an official who rules because of what his bribe giver wants is not appropriately responsive um, to the values. Um, that justify a collective self-determination. On the other hand, I don't want to say that officials should just channel what they think current popular preferences are. I also don't think that that's what this account uh, requires. So I think that officials are, have to rule in a way that they, they think is consistent with the values that make up this idea of the group standpoint. So these are abstract values that the group together endorses as providing the kind of mandate that the government should be pursuing. And I think officials need to believe that what they're doing is an actual reasonable interpretation of those abstract values. Now, that doesn't mean it needs to line up with, the, with an opinion poll, but, but I, I, something like that, I think, is what I would try to say. Um, please, all of you, forgive me for the joke I'm about to make, uh, but um, can we all join together and express our joint intention to <laughs> express gratitude Professor Stills, for the time.